The Honourable Steve Wan. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Uh, uh, it is uh, a dubious pleasure to follow on from so many coalition speakers in the budget, uh, budget yeah, yeah, yeah. take note who, who gave us once again their breathless praise of a fairly mediocre budget, oh. uh, rewriting history on the previous government's record in, oh. in budget oh. management, <laughs> despite the fact that, as I've put on record in this place many times, the black hole claims were shot black down hole. by not one but, but two uh, oh. independent assessments of the claims made by the coalition. But I won't go into black this today. Denial. And although, uh, when I do this, my usual target is the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox, I'm not oh. going to have a go at him today either, go. because sometimes go. he can be a nice person. Go at him, Matt. Uh, that, uh, the, this budget delivers only, only a few things of note. Three deficits from three for this government. Uh, and uh, three times more deficits than, than delivered by the previous Labor government over its full 16 years in office. It delivers rising debt, and uh, of course, what it does deficit every year. What it does is uh, government members in opposition. Uh, we used to see them over there. who used to get up every year and do the intellectually bereft analysis and saying, saying highest taxing government in New South Wales history is what they used to say, uh, and they constantly say it to us. Well, guess what? As the Honourable Scott MacDonald says, true, this is now the highest tax in government in New South Wales history, and on exactly the same measure that the Coalition members used to say. In fact, tax revenue has gone up $3 billion since this government came to office and is now running at $23.455 billion. And yes, it is simply because the economy grows, as it did under every year of the Labor government, and that's why tax receipts increased. And, when, uh, and so that's why it was so intellectually bereft of those opposite who used to stand up every year and claim it was the highest taxing governments in, in history. Coalition members uh, in this place in their budget speeches have regaled us with several themes. And, and the first one is that they like to tell us about how uh, this budget has, has uh, cut payroll tax by raising the threshold. 1,300 bids, businesses, they say, have been, uh, have been um, uh, removed from payroll tax. What they forget to tell us in their, in their speeches is that at the same time they've raised the threshold, they've abolished indexation of the threshold. So what they've done is gone back to the, uh, the bad old days where you have, um, er, have tax, uh, taxes where, uh, where businesses creep into the tax every year because indexation is not in place. And it's a very cynical ploy from this government because it means that in a few years' time They'll again come out and tell us with great fanfare that they're going to raise the threshold and cut the payroll tax burden for the people of New South Wales and the businesses of New South Wales who pay payroll tax, when in fact what they've done is cut out the previous <coughs> government's initiative of indexing the threshold so that the businesses didn't creep into it in the first place. And it is just a, a, an argument which is bereft of any honesty and bereft of any real value. Uh, apart from a political value in saying that they have uh, raised the threshold. We also hear um, a lot of talk about the, uh, the budget ag aggregate fig figures from, uh, from those, those opposite. And, uh, of course, we, uh, we see the figures in the uh, budget papers which give the lie to some of their comments. Uh, net debt to, uh, to gross state product, uh, which is currently the highest uh, in over a decade and getting higher under the current government in both general government sector and in the total state sector. In 05-06, under the previous government, the, the general government sector net debt to GSP was 0.4 per cent of GSP. It's now 3.2 per cent and going up to 3.6 per cent in, in 2015-16. Total state sector is now 9.9 per cent, the highest in a decade. And uh, it gives a lie to all the claims about, uh, about that this, this government gives about how uh, they are taking action on debt and reducing debt. In fact, they inherited very low debt in this state. And yes, relatively, uh, although you wouldn't know it from the recent federal election campaign, the level of debt in New South Wales is relative to most other Western nations very low. And, uh, and so we, we see yet again uh, the actual figures which give the lie to the statements that the, uh, those members opposite continue to make. Uh, what, one of the things which the budget paper does show is the very healthy growth in state, gross state product under the previous government. Uh, from 2003-04, when I entered this place, 298 
uh, billion, up to 455 uh, in 11-12. It's now risen to 494 in 13-14. And uh, one of the interesting things about that is that the growth rate in the last two, two years of the previous government uh, was higher than the growth rate in GSP under the first two years of this government. Uh, so it's 11.2 per cent growth over the last two years of the previous government versus 8.7 under the current government. So yet again, economic growth, economic growth uh, is, uh, is contrary to the bragging from those opposite, is, uh, is not matching the previous governments. And certainly for them to go around constantly talking about the previous government uh, and the dampening impact on the economy that they constantly seek to put, talk about is simply not true. Now, I was, uh, I was very interested to hear some of the previous contributions on this. Uh, every single member who got up opposite listed the hospitals that are being funded in rural New South Wales under, by this government. So let's go through a, a few of them. Why don't we go through a few of them? The Honourable Niall Blair, who talked about, uh, talked about the, the, the um, South East Regional Hospital at Bega. Uh, South East Regional Hospital at Bega, 90 per cent funded by the federal Labor government under its program, which, yes, was part of the economic stimulus package, Building the Nation funding. Uh, so the Building the Nation, the building the nation funding, uh, 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 hospitals funding program funded not just the Bega Hospital, but also, as we saw from the Honourable Marie Fakara, she mentioned the Lismore Hospital federal funding, Musselbrook, uh, she mentioned, and we've all heard about uh, the problems that they're having there with the project. Uh, Kempsey Hospital, federal funding. Port Macquarie Hospital, federal funding. Parks and Forbes, uh, also receiving some federal funding. Wagga Hospital, federal funding. The Bega Hospital, as I said, 90% federal funding. Dubbo Hospital, federal funding. Uh, the Hillston multipurpose, Peak Hill and Yamba projects, all receiving federal funding. So the reality is, without the uh, economic stimulus funding, uh, for health, for regional health, which uh, was provided by the, late, the previous federal Labor government, uh, the list of hospitals being constructed in, uh, in New South Wales, in rural New South Wales, would be meagre indeed. In fact, we would be looking pretty much at the same record we saw from the Griner government, where just one hospital was built in rural New South Wales, the Port Macquarie Hospital, the disastrous public-private partnership, which saw the taxpayers paying for that hospital uh, twice. Now, it, it is simply uh, a fact that the federal funding is going into those and that without that, those projects would not be proceeding. And uh, the uh, current government uh, in Canberra, the, uh, federal, the new federal government, which has said that it is going to abolish and cut the rest of those nation building infrastructure funds, and indeed they are listed in the savings on the uh, Liberal Party's website. Uh, that means we simply will not be seeing a continuation of capital funding for new projects. I would assume they will honour the projects already announced, and uh, uh, they have said that they will honour projects where contracts are signed, but they've made it clear that con projects where contracts are not signed will not be going ahead. And, uh, and if you do look at their savings documents, there is over a billion dollars each year listed as savings from cutting the rest of those programs. So that is bad news for the future capital needs of hospitals in New South Wales, which have been helped so significantly by uh, the, uh, by the uh, former uh, Labor federal government. Now, I want to turn to uh, some of the local issues in the budget uh, and, um, and also in the portfolio areas that I look after. Uh, first of all, I just want to briefly mention the uh, program in the budget, accelerated program of Crown Road sales, which uh, the government is engaging in. Uh, what I've discovered in recent days through questions in estimates and also through watching carefully the grants from the fishing, recreational fishing funds is that the government is using recreational fishing funding uh, to actually fund some of the costs of the sale of Crown Road's process. Uh, they are using uh, inspectors from the fisheries department to go out and do the inspections as to whether the closure of a Crown Road will impact on access for fishers. Now, if you're going to sell a Crown Road, that is part of the process which must happen. We, might, we need to make sure that we aren't restricting access to areas by closing or selling Crown Roads. But the cost of that should be paid out of the funds that are coming from the sale of land. It should not be taken off recreational fishers, and that is exactly what's happening at the moment. 
The, uh, the, the Minister and the Department has recently applied for a grant under Recreational Fishing Trust funds to fund an inspector in the Department who will go out and assist in that process of inspecting the, and reviewing the Crown Roads. Uh, that is a disgrace that those fishing licence funds, which were set up to make sure that uh, fishing, recreational fishing got extra facilities, are now being used in effect to increase the profits from the sale of Crown assets by this government. Now I turn to the uh, Monero electorate, which, as everyone would know, is an area of continuing interest for me. Uh, the list of projects, capital projects for Monero electorate is intriguing, uh, firstly for its paucity of new projects uh, which are being included in this budget. <coughs> uh, the roads funding for the Monero electorate still hasn't got up to the level that it was in the final year of the last Labor government. Uh, and what I'm most uh, distressed about, and I'm pleased the Roads Minister is in the chamber at the moment, is the fact that this year there is less than $2 million allocated to the King's Highway. Now, I took on trust, as, as people in our local area did, the Roads Minister's commitment to fully fund the recommendations of the recent review of the King's Highway, and I'm absolutely certain that needs more than just the $2 million we're starting with this year. Uh, we averaged, in the last four years of the last government, over $10 million a year investment from the state government alone, and there was federal money going there as well, into the King's Highway. We must be at least seeing that amount of money. It actually needs to keep up with effective inflation, it needs actually to be around $15 million a year. I'm not asking, and no one in our area, except some writers for the Canberra Times on occasions, is asking for a duplicated King's Highway or a freeway to the coast. That's not realistic in the, in the medium to longer term. Uh, but what we do need to see is a continuation of the really good work that was done in the last few years. We saw the area of the road between Queanbeyan and Bungendore, which was rated by the NRMA seven or eight years ago as the worst part of the road significantly improved to the point where that didn't appear on the last NRMA review, and we need to see that work continue to the part which now needs, needs assistance, which is the area from Braidwood to the Clyde Mountain. Uh, that is essential, and it needs a lot more than the $2 million allocated. Going through the list of capital works in the Monero electorate, we see most of the list, ones on the list are actually programs funded by the previous government. The Cooma TAFE workshop, uh, the Jindabyne Sport and Recreation upgrades, the uh, Perisha Range redevelopments. Uh, we've seen a massive drop in funding for social housing upgrades in Queanbeyan, and the worrying thing is that we're not seeing new public housing funded there this year, and uh, that is something which needs to happen. We saw a significant boost in public well, housing in the community, a when, um, uh, significant boost in the, the, in the community, is, is and, the uh, and that's something which needs to continue housing. to make sure that we're <laughs> providing social housing for those who need it. We've seen a number of things listed in the, uh, in the trial, program trial funding for Monero, where, <laughs> there is, uh, where there are actually existing funding. And, and I guess the overall theme of it is that is what we're seeing in the Monero electorate is unfortunately order. only what every other electorate uh, would, would get entitlement to. We're not seeing what we, we used to get, where, uh, where we saw strong proactive action to address specific local issues. And that's something which is now missing from the area. And unfortunately, with uh, with what looks like uh, being the outcome from the federal election, uh, we, we look likely to see the same thing. Um, the, uh, we're seeing one, invest, one new investment in the electorate, which was the upgrade of the new service New South Wales Centre, to, uh, which is the old RTA office in East Queanbeyan. Now, um, service, the, service, uh, the idea of having one-stop stop shop services is fine, but to locate that, area, that service in an area of Queanbeyan which has no public transport uh, going by it, uh, which is quite a long way from the centre of town and which is a, a, two bus, a ride of two buses plus a walk if you want to get there on public transport from Carabar or from, uh, or from Gerobombra or other parts of Queanbeyan other than East Queanbeyan, is to me just not logical. Why is the government only servicing people who are actually able to get there in their own vehicles? Yes, and I know a lot of the services are now available online, but not everyone has access to online, and, uh, and, certainly, and certainly the poorer people um, in the community who do, uh, who do often rely on public transport uh, to get to these locations don't have access to this facility. This facility should have been in the centre of town. The state government has an office block in the centre of town, which unfortunately is being sold by this government. And, uh, and parking, parking concerns uh, near that could easily have been resolved by using the showground next door for parking. 
Now, that is something which uh, just required a bit of thought. It is unfortunate that the current government and the local member have not put appropriate thought into the location of that facility, and I would urge them to rethink the lack of public transport access to the facility. And Brian Brown, the Honourable Rick 